essentially the most boring the most boring of all tutorials and we're supposed to be doing prostatic disease and pyometra and I'm so impressed to see so many of you here on the eve of New Year's Eve to talk mm -hmm. about reproductive diseases. Well, it's our wedding anniversary as well. Oh, um, that is a special occasion, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. we're up to number 46. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. that's amazing. Um, so the other thing that we talked about talking about when we were covering diabetes is throwing DKA into today because we didn't think we had that much to talk about with prostatic disease and pyometra. Um, so I've kind of sprung that on you. I forgot to put that in the emails and stuff. But um, let's talk about PIO first just to get it out of the way. What do they look like when they come in? It depends, but... <clears throat> The classical in my mind is a German shepherd, about eight years old, that was on mm -hmm. heat about six weeks ago. Good, yeah. And uh, sometimes the history is, oh, she was on heat or she, and she's come on again mm -hmm. um, and she can, they can be quite flat, um, mm -hmm. uh, depressed, um, dehydrated, maybe vomiting, but I don't know that that's a big feature. Yeah. Uh, polyuric, polydipsic. Good, very good. Yeah. Why, Sam? Sam, um, mute. You're on mute, uh, Sam. Because they have a secondary nephrogenic diabetes and insipidus. Very nice. <laughs> from, I think, um, endotoxins from the bacteria. Excellent. Binding, binding to the ADH receptors. Very good. Um, what's the most common bacteria that causes pyo? E. coli. Excellent. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Can be staph, strep, Pepsiella, Pseudomonas, like all sorts reported, but 70% of them are E. coli. Um, what is the mechanism of pyo developing? Oh, uh, Retained corpus luteum, I think. Mm -hmm. It's got a What's lot it? to do with it. Yeah. What does the corpus luteum produce? Progesterone. Good. So what... Can puppies get pyometra? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what but juvenile can. Like, I've seen that in a three-year-old, so... Like young dogs can, you can't, you should have that on your differential list, even for a, like a three year old. But I don't know young in that. What about a dog that hasn't had a first season? I don't think so. No. I think no. Good. Excellent. The, the mechanism of pyometra is sustained exposure to progesterone. And that's why dogs are so much more prone to it than cats and humans because of the way that their cycles work. So, who wants to tell me about the Easter cycle? <laughs> well, it's, most dogs are six monthly. Uh, um, pro estrus is about a week. Um, mm -hmm. Estrus, then they usually ovulate about the ninth day, mm -hmm. the average. Of course, no bitch is average. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the... Uh, going off periods about another week. So the, the uh, I suppose the animal husbandry version is a week, a week and a week. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Do they just have a cycle like every month or what happens after that? Every six months. Every six months, yeah. So in... certain breeds, like I think it's percentages are once a year, aren't they? Oh, right. I don't know. Um. So in between those cycles, there's a corpus luteum, regardless of whether the dog gets pregnant or not, producing progesterone for nine to 12 weeks after ovulation. So dogs get this really sustained exposure to progesterone, which impacts, what, is it, what impact does progesterone have on, uter on the uterus? Uh, 
It helps maintain pregnancy, I think, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you uh, need to, to keep the puppies in there? Thick and vascular, mm -hmm. thick and lining. Good. So endometrial hyperplasia. Good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that this morning. <laughs> Um, what else? What about the cervix? It keeps it closed. Keeps it closed, exactly. After, during that breeding period, the ovulation period, when the cervix is open, then it snaps shut and stays shut. Um, it also increases mucus production in the uterus. So has anybody, if you were thinking, oh, this dog's just post-season, I want to do an ultrasound, it's not quite right, I'm going to do an ultrasound and see if it's with PIO, and you see a fluidy uterus, what are your differentials? Good, excellent. So that's a precursor to pyometra. So different references and there's no kind of standard kind of grading for pyometra but initially it's thought that initially dogs get cystic endometrial hyperplasia associated with the progesterone exposure so the endometrial hyperplasia and then this sort of cystic um or dysregulated sort of production of endometrium and then that bacteria get trapped in there and it progresses to pyometra but you can't really have pyometra without cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Um, they're not sure if potentially bacteria that have been in there chronically contribute to cystic endometrial hyperplasia developing. Um, but yes, certainly one of the differentials. What other differentials will we have for a fluid in uterus? Hydrometra, mucometra. Very good. Yeah. What about a rat bait dog? Oh. Like a sandwich? Hemometra. Hey. Hemometra. Hemometra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's the only other differential, really. Hydrometra, mucometra, and hemometra, pyometra. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the management of the sepsis side of pyometra because I think we've sort of covered that. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Any specific questions around that? Good. Um, what's the treatment of choice? Surgery. Surgery, absolutely. What are you going to take out? A whole lot. A whole lot, absolutely. So if you leave over ovaries in, what's going to happen? You retain the corpus luteum next time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and get a stump pyo. Exactly. And if there's a hint of a stump there, it's going to end up with pyo. Um, what are the other alternatives for the clients who refuse um, surgery? In a glandons. The, yeah, there's a prostaglandin treatment, but it's not without its side effects. Yep. Yeah. Um, are there sort of criteria where you would say we absolutely need to go to surgery or, okay, we can try medical management? only because there's these sort of features of your dog's presentation? Um, if in doubt, cut it out. Yeah. It's definitely the treatment of choice for sure. Uterine rupture. Oh, yeah, that's surgical. Not an option really. What about if it was an open pyo and the dog wasn't that thick, not septic? If it was a what sort of pyo in it? An open pyo? Oh, open. Yeah. So does everyone know the difference between open and closed? Yeah. Pretty self-explanatory. So if there's vaginal discharge, then it's an open. If there's none, it's closed, essentially. But the vaginal discharge means that the uterus is much lower risk of rupture because there's, an out, there's a path of least resistance for that pus to go. So they're the cases that I would typically, I would always say we need to do surgery and only if I got a lot of pressure to not do surgery would I offer medical management. But if they're open, non-septic, 
and generally well dogs, then it's reasonable to do a trial for medical management. So only, so let's talk about the different types of medical management and then we'll go back to whether they work or not. <laughs> so Jeff mentioned prostaglandins. What do prostaglandins do? I'm guessing I probably shrink the uterus. I've forgotten all this. It's good. So um, they actually increase uterine contraction. So where progesterone causes the uterus to just relax and not contract, uh, the um, prostaglandins start causing some contractions of the uterus and they open the cervix. So it allows the uterus to kind of expel the contents. So what's the other time that we use prostaglandins? In my extensive breeding knowledge, I might be wrong here actually. Okay. Uh, is it, do we use them in unwanted pregnancy? Or to lies a corpus luteum? I remember it from horses more than dogs. Uh, I think it can be used to abort a bitch, I think. Yeah, is that <clears throat> people's memory? Let's not quote it ourselves on this one. <laughs> um, so if you use prostaglandins to medically manage PIO, only four out of 10 relapse, which I thought was quite good success, much better success than I would have thought. Now, obviously, those cases have been chosen because they're good candidates for medical management. Um, what about cats? Yeah, well, their their pyometra is generally sterile, um, and that that often is predisposed by <clears throat> um, coming on heat and not not getting pregnant. Mm. Uh, like so, uh, stud stud queens that aren't mated are, are very prone to it. Mm. Um, They're more often open as well, cats than dogs. So there's better options for management, medical management with cats as far as uh, there are better success rates for medical management with cats. Um, does anybody heard of a drug called aglipristone? Yeah. yeah so. We have it in Australia. Hello. I don't know either. They talk about it in Europe, in Edinburgh, but not Australia, weirdly. Um, yeah. um, so... Agliprostone is a progesterone receptor blocker. Why would we want, knowing our mechanism of development of PIO, how would a progesterone receptor blocker help? Basically stops the action of the progesterone, which is causing the problem. So. Yeah, exactly. So it'll help the cervix open just because the progesterone is what's keeping it closed. Um, and it's also used for unwanted pregnancies, this one. I've actually got that in my notes, so we can quote that one. Uh, and then cabergolin is sometimes used as well. Um, it's a dopamine agonist, uh, which causes luteolysis, which then decreases the progesterone as well because that's coming from the corpus luteum. So the best outcomes are with a com um, for medical management, best outcomes for surgical management, but best outcomes for medical are with a combination of the prostaglandins and the progesterone receptor blockers. And working together, they lie the corpus luteum faster, they decrease progesterone effect and production quite fast. And the outcomes usually success in between 85 and 100% in with a combination, according to a couple of studies. Um, so not too bad, but again, these are cherry picked cases who are, aren't in hospital with a closed pyo and sepsis. All right, what about a desexed female who presents with a big vulva, um, nipple development, and pyrexia? Yeah, well, that could be a stump player. 
Good. And uh, that might also be due to a little bit of ovary being left behind when they were de-sexed. Can um, you get a stump pyo without a little bit of ovary? I wouldn't have thought so. No, because you don't have the progesterone. So you've always got to go looking for both. Um, the stump and the, the ovary. So um, how are you going to diagnose that? That's tricky. Uh, I think progesterone levels you can do, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. And ultrasound, of course. Ultrasound, yeah. So Anti-malarian test and see if that's, I don't know the exact numbers of it, but if it's high, then then you have a bit like, it adds to the evidence in this probably reproductive organ there. Yep. Um, you can also measure estradiol and luteinizing hormone, which obviously shouldn't be present if there's no ovary. Um, what about a cytologic test? Can anybody think of a cytologic test we should do? Oh, like look at the smear, vaginal yeah. smear. Look at yeah, the cycle, like what stage of diastress, anistress, whatever. Exactly. I don't remember the stages. Yeah, exactly. I should have put a picture up of the cell in Edinger. It's like the vaginal cells are so profoundly different in intact females versus so yeah, castrated females. So um, yeah, vaginal smear. Um, that's all I wanted to talk about. Does anybody else have any, anything to talk about? <laughs> nope. Cool. Okay. A dog comes into you. He's an eight-year-old intact um, pit bull. And he comes into you straining to defecate. Uh, I won't make it complicated. You do a rectal and he's got a big prostate. <laughs> what are your differentials? Uh, having had a feed of cooked bones recently. No cooked bones, no. Uh, and, prostate. Um, yeah, a prostate or previous fractured pelvis, perhaps. Mm. Um, yeah. So if we just focus on the prostate, for you've done a rectal and you can feel normal stool in the rectum, but um, you can feel the prostate pushing up on the colon. Benign hyperplasia. Likely to be benign, yeah. Good, yeah. So that's one differential. What are the others? Prostatitis. One, and then, yeah, and prostatic carcinoma. Excellent. So three really, prostate amygdala, benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostatitis, or neoplasia. Um, Probably in that yeah. order as well. Probably in that order, yeah, in this dog, age-wise, breed-wise. Um, what is going to help you to kind of differentiate between the three of them. What what diagnostic tests do you want to do in this dog? Well, whether it's painful and symmetrical mm. is really important. Good. Because yeah. if it's prostatitis, it's going to be much more likely to be painful. Absolutely, yeah. Um, he's like hopping around like a bucking bronco while you're doing your rectal. <laughs> it might be painful, <laughs> but you wouldn't know. <laughs> he's symmetrical. From what you can feel, like hy it? hyperplasia is the most likely. I I don't know if this is the right notion I have, but I just feel if it's prostatitis, they have to be a lot sicker. So if it's a happy dog, then I I mean I have it and I'll write it down, but I'll say it's less likely just because mm -hmm. they are sicker, a lot sicker. Prostatitis, they are really sick. Yeah. However, I've never seen a chronic case, so because there is chronic right. prostatitis, so I don't know how they would present. Yeah, I think it's really hard to diagnose a chronic prostatitis in, because they're in intact males. So we've almost always got prostatic hyperplasia already and they're often not that sick. They don't have any neutrophilia. They've just got little fluid pockets in their prostate on ultrasound. Oh, I'm giving it away. What other tests do you want to do? Sorry. Prostatic <laughs> wash. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, you can do fine needle aspirate as well. Good, yeah. <clears throat> what are the risks of fine needle aspirate in... Um, uh, prostate with cysts in it. Uh, leakage of septic fluid from the Good. prostate or hitting the colon and getting leakage from there. Good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's got to be pretty careful, pretty guided. And we try and make sure that we empty if we're, if we're putting a needle in a fluid filled space in the prostate, we want to empty it if we can. 
So you make sure you sort of have a look at the size of the pocket you're going for, have a look at the size of the syringe you've got and make sure that you've got, you're not having to go, oh crap, I can't get enough in here and yeah, set yourself up. Uh, are there any ultrasound findings that would make you think prostatitis over benign prostatic hyperplasia? What might we be looking for? Like, does an abscess have a specific appearance on ultrasound? So, you know, like... Mm, there's overlap. Because with benign prostatic hyperplasia, they get cysts. Mm -hmm. And it, the prostate is usually quite bright with BPH. So there's a big overlap between BPH and um, uh, prostatitis, for sure. And, ab like, if there's a big abscess, then... Yes, it's more distinctive, but even then I'm never 100% sure until I put a needle in it. Um, cysts over a centimetre in diameter are more likely to be prostatitis than BPH. BPH usually less than a centimetre, but again, it's huge grey area there. Um, is Alex listening? Yeah. <laughs> Does she have anything to add to that? She's, she's half listening, half driving. Yeah, it's hard. Oh, sorry. Hi. 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 Drive. World. <laughs> um, I was just um, wondering if you had any insight on the ultrasound differences between BPH and prostatitis. Symmetry. BPH yep. is symmetrical changes. Yeah. Then prostatitis. Yeah. Um, I guess like if you have a cyst, you might expect the fluid to be more anechoic, whereas if it's an abscess, maybe it might have some like echogenic material in it. Mm -hmm. um, and surrounding like fat and muscle will be um, like hyperechoic if it's uh, prostatitis. Yeah. Um, where it's normally not too upsetting if it's just a cyst. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So I think that's a really big one the surrounds of the prostate are often pissed off if there's an active inflammatory process going on there. And BPH shouldn't be inflammatory. Mm. What causes BPH? Uh, testosterone, I guess. Ooh. Ooh. Like the DHT, right? Like the yes. uh, precursor or one of the testosterones. Yes, exactly. Let me see if I can share with you. Can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So this is the kind of pathway to prostatic hyperplasia. We've got gonadotrophin releasing hormone. We've got follicles, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the pituitary. And then that stimulates testosterone production. But it's actually this dihydrotestosterone which causes the initiation of like hyperplasia or hypertrophy and the increased production of prostatic fluid. Um, so the reason I like this little kind of flow chart of how those hormones impact, like that kind of sequence of events to cause hyperplasia is because then we, when we start talking about treatments, you can see where each of the different options kick in. So if we're going to manage... Um, prostatic hyperplasia with surgery, castration, we are going to cut off the link between FSH, LH and testosterone, right? Because there's no, there's no, no, no gonads to produce the testosterone. So that's kind of along that sequence of events, that's how that works. Very thorough and the most effective way to shrink a prostate in a hurry. What other options, medical options are there? Finasteride is Good. one. Yep. I think, and that, that? I think that works by stopping testosterone being converted to dihydrotestosterone. Are you cheating? DHT. Yeah. DHT. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the implant. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but that's a GnRH inhibitor. Mm -hmm. What's the implant called again? There's Lauren. Yes, that one. Lauren. Yeah. So the two that Josh has just mentioned, finasteride is probably the best tolerated, particularly because a lot of the clients that decline castration are ones that want to breed from their dogs. 
So if you use finasteride, they can breed again in four to six months. So what finasteride does is inhibits this 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which converts testosterone to the dihydrotestosterone. So we then don't get that um, hy prostate hypertrophy and increased prostatic fluid production. Um, whereas if we use the supralorum up here, we block, we decrease the impact of the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. But they, the dogs are really unpredictable when they're going to come back into being able to breed, which for a breeder is hard to manage. Um, so sometimes they're still unable to ejaculate 12 months after a six-month implant. So um, as far as kind of choices, if, if that's the, the owner's motivation, finasteride is a superior choice. I'm going to get rid of that. Does anybody need that? All right, what about prostatitis? What causes prostatitis? E. coli. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So how do we get in there? Uh, by the urinary tract, I guess. Good. Yeah, it's um, ascending infection. Yeah. The most common thing. Yep. Uh, and how are you going to diagnose it? Well... Palpation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, rectal palpation. Mm -hmm. um, probably there'd be an increased white cell count. Mm -hmm. um, as a sick dog, as someone else has made us, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, um, ultrasound, obviously. Mm -hmm. Just going to add to it. Are there any specific ways to? Um, collect prostatic fluid other than aspirate? Uh, the uh, prostatic wash. Good. Excellent. How easy is that to do? I think to get it right, it's quite difficult. But it's <laughs> I've never simple. been successful. <laughs> I find it very difficult. Um, what about, and fortunately, uh, most of the time we can just collect a sample of prosthetic fluid, but uh, I mean, like uh, via ultrasound. Um, what about electro ejaculation? Has anybody ever used that to diagnose? No. No. What is that? I don't even know what that is. Um... <laughs> you don't I mean, want to know. Yeah. The first practice I had, I inherited a, a one that they used on rams that might have worked on dogs, but I don't know where it is now. It's long gone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did project on that at uni with rams. Um, did you? Yeah. So yeah. that's a nasty flashback. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to be of service. I block that out. Uh, I've used Upstairs, a there was a, a room like on the third floor, there were sheep in the vet building area. Yes. It was so strange. We never knew they were there before that. Yeah. <laughs> I've used it on bulls. Um, oh, yeah. Apparently the reason that led to it, the discovery, was they discovered that um, the Americans who were executing their criminals with the electric chair, they found that they were all ejaculating. Wow. Uh, so that's where the idea came from. Right. Um, so... In answer to your question, Fuja, how do you do it? <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> we don't want to electrocute the animal. Yeah, no, no, we're doing it. <laughs> more, more topical application of the electrical um, impulse. Uh, that's amazing trivia, actually, Jess. <laughs> it's not so much for the pub, but in this crowd. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, uh, excellent. Uh, how are you, you going to treat prostatitis? Well, uh, fibrocinate is, is a good antibiotic for it because it will penetrate better. Which one, sorry? Uh, trimethoprin sulfonamide. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Why, <clears throat> why is the prostate special? Why does it, um, why do we need to be selective with our antibiotic choice? Um, because yeah, a lot of uh, 
there must be a, a sort of barrier that prevents um, uh, drugs getting through from the uh, circulation. Yeah. So you have to be lipid soluble drugs. And the prostatic fluid is quite alkaline. So the medications have to be stable in an alkaline environment and able to bind and have their activity and do their job in um, sort of a quite a specific environment that we don't really test them in anywhere, anywhere else in the body. Um, so tribrisin is a really good choice. Um, what's another one that's commonly recommended for prostatitis? Thoroquinolone. Is that what you said, Josh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So obviously with antimicrobial stewardship, we're not reaching straight for fluoroquinolones. Um, interestingly, it was pointed out to me by um, a very smart vet. I was sort of thinking, oh, I really want to give this dog in rifloxacin for pyelonephritis. And, um, but, you know, the antimicrobial stewardship guidelines say don't use that as a first line. And we didn't have, the dog had already been on clab, so we had a negative urine culture. So we didn't have a, like, a type. But this dog was still so sick, so pyrexic, 20, 48 hours after Clav had started. Um, and I said, I really want to give him Enro, but the consensus statement says I can't. And this very smart GP vet said, well, this consensus on the management of complicated UTIs says that you should use it as a first line and at this dose. So let's do it. <laughs> so um, it's definitely in the consensus statement. Complicated UTI in, includes prostatitis or renal involvement. So you can use, according to that consensus statement, um, and rifloxacin at the first line in those situations. So if anybody gives you grief from an antimicrobial stewardship consensus statement point of view, you can say, but I have this consensus statement and there's no consensus here. Mm. With the renal involvement, is there any, like, you know, with IRIS guidelines, like, is it more to do it when it's stage three versus stage two versus stage one? Like, or any, like, would you... When to use keeping, Yeah, keeping antimicrobial stewardship in your head. Like, would uh, you differentiate whether it's stage one, stage two, stage three? Uh, it doesn't differentiate, no, whether they're in ren renal failure or not. And in fact, this dog wasn't even azotemic. Okay. It so was not. just really sick with quite abnormal kidneys on ultrasound um, and a very a profound pyuria. But because we didn't get a urine sample till 48 hours after Clav had started, no bacteria in the urine. Um, so it's presumptive diagnosis um the consensus statement doesn't say what stage of renal disease they're in and sort of how hard you need to go but for me gram negative infections tend to cause sepsis more commonly than gram positive infections just because of the degree of endotoxin in their um, cell walls so if i've got a dog that's pyrexic and not responded to clav which will cover staph strep anaerobes and the likes, uh, then I'm pretty sure it's gram-negative and I'm pretty sure I need to use enrofloxacin or I'm not going to use gentamicin in a patient with already having renal injury. Mm. Um, okay. So that, that's my kind of justification, I think, in this patient. But I'd usually reach, reach for amoxicillin first for a urinary tract thing. Mm -hmm. uh, amoxicillin won't get into the prostate. Just or it won't work very well in the prostate, so it's not a good choice for prostatic prostatitis. Okay, are we finished? Reproductive? Can I ask a question? Oh no. <laughs> yes. Sorry. It has to do with um, treatment, and mm -hmm. um, I just remember this coming up in clinic before about if you're gonna if you're going to castrate a dog that mm -hmm. has prostatitis. Mm -hmm. um, as far as having to uh, start antibiotics and then wait, there was like an argument about how long you need to wait before you would then castrate, mm -hmm. having to do with like less success if you castrated, say on day one, than if you left the dog entire for a few weeks. Oh, right. I haven't seen any information on that, but I think probably outcome wise, they're less suitable candidates for surgery if they've presented septic and they're often with acute prostatitis do present very unwell. So in that situation, I'd stabilise for a week and then castrate. 
because prostatitis is so uh, we use long causes of antibiotics in prostatitis so three to six weeks depending on what reference you look at so we've got a big window to get that surgery done and castration prevents relapse and you want the prostate to atrophy which decreases the risk of relapse so if we do it if we start antibiotics castrate a week later and then we start to get atrophy within two to four weeks post-op then we're still on antibiotics and we've got a good overlap where we're kind of getting rid of the current infection and preventing relapse so that would be my approach okay second question yeah is um every, every time i've had a prostatic carcinoma um they've all had like a very similar sort of snowburst appearance on x-ray and oh, uh, yeah. like, a, okay. like a calcification that looks mm -hmm. extremely dramatic yeah um i'm not sure if that's pathognomonic for neoplasia or if prostatitis could look like that chronic inflammation causes mineral deposit so if you had a chronic prostatitis theoretically it could look like that okay um the reason why carcinomas cause mineralization is because they're quite inflammatory tumors um but you're right mineralization in the prostate is most commonly associated with carcinoma Okay, thank you. No worries. Okay, now can we talk about, oh, I should, should we talk about prostatic carcinoma? I suppose we should. Causes mineralization, causes prostatomegaly, <laughs> you diagnose it by aspiration. What are the treatment options? Oh, Chemo. Chemo, yeah. good. Yeah. Ra radiation probably too. Yeah. Good. But uh, surgical removal is not, not uh, really an option. Not great. Associated with lots of complications. Um, so what, what are the different ways we can deliver chemo? Like single drug versus multi-drug? Is that multi-agent? Like that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, the carboplatin, I think, is used. Yeah, uh, carboplatin and mitoxantrone, I think, are the main ones. Um, uh, chemo is pretty well tolerated. It's usually just one injection every three weeks. What's the other component of the kind of treatment protocol? There's a chemo drug and then something else. Well. Good. And I don't want to un I the, I don't want to underestimate the value of the non-steroidals in treatment of both TCC and prostatic carcinomas. Um, we've seen so many patients who have been on paroxicam as part of their chemo protocol and they get side effects of the paroxicam and you withdraw the paroxicam for two weeks just because they've got diarrhea or not eating or something and their, their disease just blows up. Like the anti-neoplastic properties of non-steroidals in these diseases are quite profound um, because it's such an inflammatory disease as well. Often we've got urethral compression and stranguria as a presenting sign. You take away the non-steroidals, you take, you get edema back, you get swelling back, and that causes that just exacerbates the compression of the urethra, and that can really trigger a kind of a euthanasia event, like if they get blocked and need hospitalisation. So make sure your non-steroidals are sustainable in these ones. So I'm. Um, Whilst paroxicam is definitely what's recommended by the oncologists, I find we have to have drug holidays more commonly with paroxicam than other non -steroidals. Would anyone agree with that? Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. Yes, they also side effects. Yeah. Less so with meloxicam, I think. Less so with meloxicam and even less so with furacoxib. But in my experience, that's so anecdotal. Um, but as we kind of get more data coming out of using different non-steroidals instead of paroxicam, paroxicam isn't that superior to the other, particularly when you sort of think, oh, you've got to take it away more often. Um, so sometimes when, the, you know, in the absolutely do everything owners, you definitely want to follow all the instructions to the T, to a T. Um, but in the owners that are just like, I just want my dog to feel well for us, for you know whatever time we have 
Um, those ones I tend to use are very well tolerated non steroidal rather than paroxicam, just to make sure that we can keep them on it. Um, what about if they presented with urethral obstruction? What other treatment options are there? Urethral stent. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So urethral stent. So if you look at the survival times of with chemo, so three months with prostatic or TCC carcinomas, um, six to 12 months with chemo, and then 12 to 24 with chemo and urethral stenting. So it's improved survival time quite significantly. A female dogs more likely to get incontinent as a result of urethral stenting, but male dogs tend to tolerate them really well. Um, and if the owners are okay with incontinence, then great for a female dog, really well tolerated and just buys time. What about, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? The vascular, laser. hey? The laser, you mean? Like a oh. laser of laser? Oh, um, for TCCs, that's interesting. Okay, um, so, yeah, positional cell carcinoma. Yeah, yeah. So um, did you go to that round? Go what, sorry? Go to that rounds where they were talking about doing that? I don't know. Oh, the recent one? Yeah, Vsauce one. Yeah, I don't remember them talking about it. Oh. Not, not, but um, but I, I remember reading about it in the interventional book about yeah. how you can kind of cut away parts of um, tumour, um, yeah. but it can be quite challenging if it's really like blocking up a ureter or... Yeah. Uh, and you got to be careful not to bust the bladder. Yeah. So the difference, so in humans, if a human has a TCC, they're normally proliferative and confined to the mucosa when they're diagnosed. So they're projecting into the bladder. So what they do, the interventionists do in humans is inject the submucosa with a wang needle with methylene blue and infiltrate it underneath so that they know they're not going any deeper than the submucosa. And then they just cut the tumour away until they get down to the blue and de like debulk it that way. Whereas with our patients, that TCCs are invasive in dogs where they aren't in here, they, they go through the submucosa in dogs. So you might inject the submucosa and you're not getting all the tumour. So um, you can kind of dig a lot deeper than you think you should because it's not actually something goes or it's tumour there that goes right through the wall. So it's a little bit harder to do in dogs, but certainly debulking is an option. Um, that Vsauce round, they talked about another treatment option for prostatic carcinoma. Oh, uh, embolization. Embolization, yeah. What does that involve? What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's when you catheterize um, to basically get to like the, um, like a, the prostatic, I can't remember which artery artery it is but you get to one of them mm -hmm. um it has to be the right one because one of them um provides blood to the bladder so if you block that then you can destroy the bladder but if you get to the right um blood flow to the prostate you can embolize it with these little spheres which blocks blood flow and basically starves the cancer of oxygen i think it's the yeah nutrients. that's the theory um and it's really it's associated with quite dramatic results if it's done correctly um, so, yeah, very good treatment option, minimally invasive. Obviously, size of the dog is an issue because you've got to get catheters in and stuff, so medium to large breed dogs only. Um, but it's a really good option if um, people are interested in doing everything. And but this option, because like by the time you diagnose prostatic carcinoma in a dog, it's actually metastasized. Yeah. Like, how would this treatment option be superior? Because the this, like... You've, you've embolized one artery, but then what mm -hmm. about the metastatic? Like you would yeah, have to so do something else. Not, right? Yeah, certainly not curative. Um, uh, and it's part yeah. of chemo. Like you, you definitely do chemo as well. Yeah. But what it is, because most dogs don't die from their metastases. Most dogs die from obstruction of their urinary tract. Yeah. So if it decreases the risk of that, yeah. then you've got years and years of added 
lifetime potentially as long as you're kind of on top of of mats and pain where do these tumors usually met to i think lymph node the some blah blah some uh, sub lumbar lymph node is a big yeah. one bone yeah. Bone. bone exactly so they metastasize locally into femur hip spine pelvis so the bones around the prostate tend to get little tiny mets in them and I thought you know they're tiny and they're within the bone you can't see them on an x-ray and it's only really when you kind of start CTing dogs that you sort of go oh my gosh they're just everywhere and that's a really big source of morbidity in these patients. So another indication to making sure that the non steroidals are we're able to maintain non steroidal dosing. Um, so even if we don't know there's mets, there's usually mets. Is that and similar maybe. for the TCC metting to local bone? Yes. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Prostatic carcinoma. Are they are they related? Are they type of TCC? Yeah, often a type oh. of TCC. So you can have glandular or you can have a TCC, but they, we usually just say prostatic carcinoma because it's in fact in the prostate, but they're either. Oh, Sorry, okay. What did you mean by TCC? Transitional cell carcinoma. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now can we stop talking about reproof? <laughs> um... Because DKA is way more fun. <laughs> okay, so we talked about diabetes. We all know about diabetes. What is DKA relative to diabetes? What's the difference? The DKA is a sick diabetic, whereas just a diabetic's usually not sick. Good. Um, yeah. What makes them sick? Acidosis. Um, Good. Uh, what makes them acidemic? Uh, the uh, keto acids. Good. Yes. Excellent. Um, why would a patient produce ketones when they're? Yeah. Why? What? How do ketones get produced? Um, well, when, when the body's not getting a glucose energy source, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, your ketone cycle kind of kicks in. So that's when you start getting breakdown of fats um, mm -hmm. to produce ketones as an energy source. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So ketones are an alternate energy source for um, for cells, essentially. I'm going to share a really complicated diagram that just like stimulates my medicine brain and you all just have to put up with it. Okay. <laughs> Oopsies. Um, is everyone as excited as me? <laughs> yes. It is yeah, that's, that's... Oh, no. Oops. Sorry. Oops. <laughs> um, okay. So... When the body is starved of glucose, we get lipolysis and free fatty acids come out of the adipocytes, go into circulation and hit the hepatocyte. So we've got free fatty acids entering the hepatocyte to be utilised as an energy source. So the two options when a fatty acid hits the hepatocyte is that it participates in fat synthesis when you're in an anabolic state, when you're building, when you're storing, but when you're in a catabolic state which is diabetic ketosis or diabetes then the free fatty acids are going to go into the mitochondria the beta oxidation whoa sorry whoa <laughs> i was not finished uh, oh no wrong one <laughs> sorry um so the Fatty acids are converted to acetyl-CoA. Does anybody remember what acetyl-CoA does? Yeah, what well, cycle is it in? Krebs cycle, isn't it? Good, yeah. Um, and what does Krebs cycle do? Uh, it, it 
it puts phosphate on the a, on the ADP. I Good. Think. Yeah. Um, so the the point the acetyl CoA can either participate in energy production. So the Krebs cycle produces NADH, which then participates in oxidative phosphorylation, which is what Jeff just said, putting the P's on the ATs. Um, so we get ATP production. Or the acetyl-CoA can be converted into ketones to be utilised as energy. So if we've exceeded the capacity of the body to process the Krebs cycle, or if we've got any deficiencies in any of the other cofactors in that Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, then we're going to get all this acetyl-CoA. Oh, for goodness sake. Sorry. <laughs> all this acetyl-CoA being produced into ketones. So the two main causes of ketone production are either excess fatty acids, which exceed the capacity of the system, or a deficiency in cofactors in the Krebs cycle, which shunts um, the process towards ketone production. Make sense? Mm. So tell me about, I'm going to stop sharing now. So these are the ketone bodies that are produced. Acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. So tell me about how ketones impact the pH of the blood. They're acidic, so mm -hmm. it decreases the pH. Good. Excellent. Um, so when you've got a decreased pH, what is the main ion that contributes to that? Acid base, like basic acid base. Don't overthink it. Uh, hydrogen, is that what it is? Yeah, hydrogen, exactly. Yeah, so hydrogen, hydrogen is sure. acid, right? So when you've got, when you're, when you've got, when you're acidemic, you've got more hydrogen. And beta hydroxybutyrate is essentially acetoacetone plus hydrogen. So when you're, the more acidemic you get, the more beta hydroxybutyrate you get. When you're testing for ketones, how are you doing it? Like either on urine or blood, you can check. Like, mm -hmm. Good. Yep. Yeah. What do you do on the urine to check for ketones? Not dipstick. Yeah, dipstick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which of those three ketones yeah. are not detected by a dipstick? I think it's the beta hydroxybutyrate, it, isn't it? It is, exactly. So you could get a negative ketone on your dipstick if you're really acidemic. Because that we because you've got more hydrogen, you're gonna have more beta hydroxybutyrate. So it's all gonna be shifted towards that. When you do blood, if you send your blood off blood profile off to Vetnostics and they think it's diabetic, what ketone test are they gonna run? Beta hydroxybutyrate is what they Yes, do. exactly. So that's what that's the one that they measure by preference. Which is the one you can smell on their breath? I can smell nothing, but you say acetone. <laughs> I can smell nothing. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, so as acetone. So it's apparently a fruity smell. I can't smell it. Can anyone smell it? No. No? Interesting. I think people tell me that, that they can in clinics all the time. Like, no one can smell it. I think it's genetic. It's genetic if you as to whether you can smell it or not. Yes. I think we're maybe breeding that gene out. Yes. It's for veterinarians only. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there I have I have come across some clients who will say, and I'm digressing a bit, but UTIs they'll come in saying that I can smell the E. coli in the urine. Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I can that's smell good. That. Yeah, we need to go back to that chapter in Edinburgh that was like what you can detect with your nose. <laughs> um, <laughs> your chapter, Anna. The yeah. in-house there's like an in-house little um, machine for ketones. Yeah, is it measuring the beta? It's blood, right? Yes. Yes, I think so. Okay. I can't. I don't really know, to be honest. Okay. Um. 
So what other reasons would these patients have to be acidemic other than their ketones? Uh, they develop a degree of renal failure, I think. Oh, why? Um, can't remember why. Um, this is a question for our emergency vets. What when when a patient presents with DKA? Um, yes, I know. Dehydration. Good. They are very yeah, dehydrated. dehydration. Really dehydrated. So these dogs lactic acid. Yes, exactly. These dogs because they've got high glucose, they've got this osmotic diuresis. They can't concentrate their urine. So they've just got fluid pouring out of them and they're often nauseous vomiting and they've got other losses and they can't hydrate themselves because they're nauseous. So they get profoundly dehydrated in a very short amount of time. Then they get decreased perfusion, lactic acidosis, and then renal insufficiency and acidosis because they can't excrete um, uh, acid as well. Um We're probably a little bit out of time. Any like last thing you want to talk about with BKA? We can uh, continue next time. We can continue next time. Management of it with different protocols of uh, insulin. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's, there's uh, I mean, there's the intermittent hourly dosing one, mm. and then you've got um, the intravenous. Uh, uh, concentrated infusion. Yeah. Um, I'm not overly opinionated on what protocol you use and what I want. So in theory, if we're just being purists and saying what's the best thing for this disease, an insulin CRI that's titrated according to like as like one hourly blood glucoses is the most superior way to get the glucose under control in a very controlled fashion. I've just been in way too many clinics where the staff don't understand the consequences or the drip pumps aren't um, micro enough or, or aren't sort of um, sophisticated enough to deliver insulin at a really reliable rate. I've seen so many insulin overdoses and so many insulin underdoses that go for a period of 24 hours sometimes because you kind of set this up and you don't review it often or you know there's just too many possibilities for mistakes with with CRIs so there are definitely situations where I use it in and definitely teams where I'm really happy to use it with equipment and I'm really happy to use it but it's definitely not the right way for every patient in every situation so intermittent yeah. insulin dosing is safer I think particularly if you've got one person responsible for it but these are patients I would put an insulin a uh, glucose monitor on or a central line, one of the two, because you really need to be getting glucose at least every hour and they need to be in 24 hour clinics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, general, my experience, general practices just, just are not set up for routine no. monitoring. No. Uh, no they just it. can't manage it. No, it's too intensive. And, you know, I think we've all been in situations where you drop the ball and you think, well, how did this glucose get to 32? In two hours, <laughs> I needed someone to be sitting with this patient. I just didn't have that person there. So, we, I mean, you read the textbook and we know what to do based on the textbook. It's the CRI and it's, you know, titrating according to this, but we need to be a little bit practical sometimes as well. The most, da most dangerous part of the day, in my experience, is the shift change. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so next one, I think, is renal physiology. So um, we can talk a little bit about electrolytes with regards to DKA then. Um, there's no, yeah, I'm not going to give you like a, a treatment cheat sheet for DKA. It's just so tailored according to the dog. So don't get your hopes up, Jeff. Um, all right. I'm going on holidays. Oh, enjoy your holidays, Ella. Thanks. Yeah, congratulations. Have a Where great time. Just cross harbour. Where are you off to? Um, just